Hello, folks. This is Michael with the Reason RX podcast, and my co-host Melanie in Minnesota, and our honorary co-host <laughs> God in San Antonio. <laughs> right, <laughs> Melanie in Minnesota, Scott in San Antonio, and the very non-alliterative Michael in Houston. So. Hope you're enjoying the podcast, folks. If you could remember, um, please share it with teachers, principals, school personnel, education personnel. Listen to it yourself. Students will benefit. Um, Friends. A lot of information here that's important for thinking and learning and education in general and not just when we're young. Um, Education is not, well, at least learning. Education, yeah. As a process, something when we're young. Um, Learning in general, though, is, unless we're dead, it's ongoing. Or if you're in a coma or something, maybe. But something that's going on 24-7. Well, except maybe not so much when we're sleeping or something like that. But um, occurs all our lives. We're always learning, so this material is valuable. Um, And we got to remember that we're rational animals with all these different aspects um, we got to think about um, learning from a holistic perspective according to our nature in the world, um, not just take things out of context, and there's a lot of that good information in these podcast um, episodes about that. Um, and if you would uh, donate a little bit, please, that'd help, you know, so we can get some better equipment, have better quality sound, um, market the podcast a little bit maybe get some marketing materials maybe someone could design a like um logo or something for us um while melanie is artistic (laughs) sculpture and painting is not part of that thing right (laughs) besides you wouldn't have so much time for it but um so that'll help it help you know each of us help the culture um, help make this a better world if we could have uh, more rational methods and theories of education out there, more widespread. Um, so, today um, we're going to be looking at, starting to look at uh, some fallacies in learning and education. And we'll do different things. Um, In the future, we can look at the left brain, right brain fallacy thing. Um, What are some others we can dig into? Today, we'll look at learning styles. We can look at the myth that we only use 10% of our brains. Oh, yeah. That novices and experts cannot think in all the same ways. Uh, And this really leads us into the cognitive architecture. How does our brain work? Yeah. And then in our mind, not just the brain, people talk about your brain, your brain, your brain. Folks, what about your mind? It's not the same thing. But sorry, go ahead, Scott. What else? Yeah. And I I use the analogy of hardware versus software. Um, Mm -hmm. Chapter. Three in my class of psychology is biology and behavior. We look at the hardware of the brain, the neurons, neurotransmitter chemicals, how that all works. And that's the physical action. But then we get later to cognitive development, and that's essentially the software of the mind. So you're, you're correct. We need to look at both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that and more um, are things we could look at in the future. Um or the idea that if you throw more money at it, it'll be better. Or the idea that um, if you do the same thing but put it on the internet instead, it'll be better, and all of a sudden it's great. You know? Um, yes. If you do it with technology, it's somehow better. Yeah. If it's Platonism in the classroom, bad. But if it's Platonism on the internet, oh, it's great. Not. <laughs> okay. So, um, some stuff we can look at in the future. But, as I say, today we'll look at the theory of learning styles um, and different theories of learning styles. If you look it up, you know, some people, for some reason, 
are enamored with the word model and you hear model this, model that, model the other. Um, it's a theory as far as I'm concerned. Someone's learning style theory. Mm -hmm. um, but learning styles in general, how would you describe learning styles, Scott? It's the idea that um, some people learn better by reading, so they're a visual learner or watching a movie. Some people learn better by listening to someone explain it, auditory style, or have a kinesthetic style, so kind of a hands-on manipulative approach. And I think this is inherently appealing to educators because one word that's really big in education is differentiation. And while it's true that we ideally are going to differentiate things, that doesn't extend to the idea that we're all better in some things, which then extends to, and therefore I can't learn in that style. Mm. Yeah, which you so, see kids argue. Yeah, so we'll get into some of the um, some of the people who are working on this, some of the research. Um, talk philosophy on it because that's something that's like left out a lot we need to bring in the philosophical aspect um into the culture more um bring in some aspects that are fundamental that are not discussed not researched and that um are much more fundamentally important but yeah if we look on the great wikipedia um you know just kind of same as what scott said and um some people say don't look on Wikipedia, but I think it's like in some classes, a teacher doesn't want to teach how to start a sentence with because, because it's too hard for the kids at the time. And so some people are left with the idea that you shouldn't start a sentence with because, and that's ludicrous. Because is a subordinating conjunction, and you can start sentences with subordinating conjunctions. And because because is a subordinating conjunction and because I can start sentences with subordinating conjunctions and because I like the word because I will start sentences with the word because there I just said three clauses with the word because in it before my main clause and it's a valid sentence deal with it you know but there's um, some things like that going on um, people get some false ideas um, from teaching or like when they're in school and we're not thinking about it they don't think about too much about some stuff but I don't care about what some people say about Wikipedia you should use it just use it intelligently and that's the point the point is not to like it's just like the word because don't start a sentence with because don't use Wikipedia wrong be intelligent about it have a brain think be logical and critical you know, I use Wikipedia a lot because I can. And if someone doesn't think you should, well, then you need to like rethink your ability to be in, engage in independent thought and deal with reality. Um, or, you know, I've even like been on something on Facebook where I no, it's like on nextdoor.com where I mentioned something about Wikipedia and someone was all snarky. Well, if you use Wikipedia, I didn't say anything because I wanted to be a good neighbor. Otherwise, I would have responded. Well, if you weren't such an idiot, you could use Wikipedia. But so go into Wikipedia. It's fine to use if you use it intelligently. It's a good source of finding sources for other things. You know, you look it up. Mm -hmm. It's got sources at the end. You look at them and stuff. You read it critically. Think, mm -hmm. think for yourself. But on the great Wikipedia, it says learning styles refer to a range of competing and contested theories. That's not non-essential. Okay, learning styles refer to a range of theories. The aim to account for differences in individuals learning. Individuals, plural. These theories propose that all people can be classified according to their style of learning. Um, although the various theories present differing views on how the styles should be defined and categorized. A common concept is that individuals differ in how they learn. Um, and then some history. It became popular in the 1970s, but I think there's um, historical roots of it before that, 60s and 50s, if not before. And it says it's greatly influenced education despite the criticism, some criticisms that it's had. Um, 
and let me see on this other thing where it is that um on this site on vanderbilt university the term learning styles is widely used to describe how learners gather sift through interpret organize come to conclusions about and store information for further use so here notice that they're doing more than the other one um in this one i think they're including what people used to call like some people differentiate cognitive style from learning style and this is including both whereas on wikipedia um well no it would, it would seem to include both too but for some stuff they're just not concerned with so much cognitive style but specifically how you interact with your environment and therefore auditory visual it's not a cognitive thing so this one here on vanderbilt has the behavior the interaction with your environment the auditory visual stuff but then interpreting and organizing and stuff as well um and then they kind of maybe they don't I'll have to look and see if what else is going to happen here but it looks like they get confused um because they talk about storing information for furthering use so it's cognitive and learning style but then they say as spelled out in spark one of the most popular learning styles inventories these styles are often categorized by sensory approaches, visual, oral, verbal, reading, writing, and kinesthetic. Um, many of the models, you know, theories that don't resemble the VARC's sensory focus are reminiscent of Felder and Silverman's index of learning styles with a continuum of descriptors for how learners process and organize information. Active reflective sensing intuitive verbal visual sequential global there are well over 70 different learning style schemes most of which are supported by quote a thriving industry devoted to publishing learning styles tests and guidebooks unquote and quote professional development workshops for teachers and educators unquote that'd make a bit of money um last part they said it's supported by a thriving education industry. <laughs> they didn't say it's supported by empirical research and cognitive psychology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Wow. 70 uh, over 70 styles? Yeah, and I've heard uh, that. Let me. We're, and let me throw in a real quick. Uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Scott. <laughs> go ahead. A great study if our readers want to look at uh, this and some of the things that will future episodes is uh, by Kirchner and Van Marenbauer. Do learners really know best? Urban legends in education. Yeah. Let me just read this short paragraph. Um, mm -hmm. They cite the study of Cofield in 2004, described 71 different learning styles. If we start from the conservative assumption that each learning style is dichotomous, there would already be two to the 71st power combinations of learning styles. This means that there are many more combinations of styles than people living on Earth. <laughs> yeah, that's a great paragraph. I love that. And then some theories have like maybe four learning styles, some have seven, some have like 19, stuff like that. Um, all this stuff. Let me read this land, last paragraph on Vanderbilt's. Um, it says... Despite the variation in categories, the fundamental idea behind learning styles is the same, colon, that each of us has a specific learning style, sometimes called a preference, and we learn best when information is presented to us in this style. Um, for example, visual learners would learn any subject best or any subject matter best if given graphically or through other kinds of visual images. Kinesthetic learners would learn more effectively if they can involve body, bodily movements in the learning process and so on. The message thus given to instructors is that optimal instruction requires diagnosing individuals' learning styles and tailoring instruction accordingly. Um, and then um, we'll get into some of this more later, but Vanderbilt does go on to say, um, despite the popularity of learning styles and in inventories such as the VARC, it's important to know that, this is in bold, there is no evidence to support the idea that matching activities to one's learning style improves learning. Um, 
It's not simply a matter of the absence of evidence doesn't mean the evidence of absence. On the contrary, for years, researchers have tried to make this connection through hundreds of studies. Okay. Um, so there's the basic idea we're going to dig into a bit. Um, and before we get into some of the philosophy and science and um, pros and cons and criticism and all that, we're going to take some of these learning inventories. So this is a, some like one of the things that is given to some people to assess what style of learning they supposedly have. Um, and then we can discuss that fact and what's involved there after we do some of these. But So let's take some. So here's um, learning style inventory, and I'll put a link to this, um, Godot.org or something like that. Um, let's see. Godot.org. Um, let me see if that's like a site. And then I can go back to this learning inventory test thing. Come on, Internet. Crank it up. So... Um, Georgia Department of Education. Oh, that's what it is. Godot. G-A-D-O-E. So this is Georgia Department of Education. I'm not sure what else is around this. If this is just something they have up. But um, on their site, they got a learning style inventory. I don't know what the context is. Maybe they say it's bad somewhere or whatever. But um, here it is. So, okay. So this is a... 14 question test that is intended with 14 questions to pin your learning style. Okay? So, um, we're going to go through this. Um, okay, computer, move that. Get this over here. Alright, so it says directions. Circle the letter before the statement that best describes you. Um, and did y'all get that Melanie and Scott because I spoke it should I send it to you so you can look at it and read it or should I dance it out circle the letter yeah. before the statement that just described one. you I want to see that that's how I learn best if you yeah. could dance for me so, or play on the piano for I'll me. have to make a video and put that on YouTube circle the letter before the statement that best describes you okay so, number one. Okay, now it's got these questions, and it's got VAK, so visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Um, and what's the other one? Um, reading, that they have bark. Um, they only have VAK here. So, if I have to learn how to do something, I learn best when I... V, watch someone show me how. A. Here's someone. Tell me how. K, try to do it myself. K, what do y'all say? I refuse to answer on principle. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Melody? Which one are you? I mean, if I had to pick, I guess I always learn better when I'm doing it. You know, watching someone else do it is never the same. But I mean, but it takes a little learning before you can actually do it yourself. So it, it's the question's weird. I mean, yeah, it's like. And plus, Either okay, or, you know? my answer is, Either. what the hell am I trying to learn? Who's teaching yeah. me? And what yeah. is it? I don't want to watch everybody. Some people are too pathetic to, like, listen to. They can't I describe it. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to watch them. <laughs> you know, so it depends. And, like, what is the activity? Driving? Dancing? Singing? Um, doing some movement activity? Reading? Like, some biology concept or what? I don't know. So it's like, Hello? Some people, maybe I'd want to hear because they can describe it well, and I'd love to hear their language. Some people I'd want to watch. What if I'm dancing? I don't want to hear someone tell me how. I want to see him demonstrate it first, you know? Like, what's someone going to say? Oh, use your tricep to pull up your inner cordial knee and da-da-da-da-da. Like, what the hell? You don't learn to dance that way. You watch. Then you got to do it yourself. What were you going to say, Scott? 
Well, it's just a false premise. The whole question is a bad premise because, as Mike said, <laughs> what the re research shows is that it's better suited when you match the modality with the task at hand. So dancing, yes, would obviously demonstrate that. Um, it, it really does depend on the task. Um, but even then, all of those different forms can contribute to a deeper understanding. It just depends on how do we present this to a novice. Yeah. And it's, it's not what they prefer. It's what the best method to teach that thing is. Yeah, and sometimes you need to do all of them. Like in learning to dance, they demonstrate it, then they talk about it, and you try it, and they talk about it more, maybe demonstrate again, you try it again, they talk about it, you try it again. It's interaction, so, and it's a dance between them all. So to, to get to what you were just saying, Scott, you're saying that if someone says, like say they want to take dancing lessons, and they come to the dance instructor and say, I learn best by reading. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying, now the dance instructor is supposed to go, do I have a textbook here on how to dance the foxtrot? You know, you're saying it's better taught because it's dancing by watching the person dance, you're saying. And maybe some instruction along the way, like don't forget to point sure. your foot or whatever. But and, and the research shows that if we are going to match anyone's style, it should be the teacher's rather than the particular Good. student. Interesting. Yeah. And then also, again, how is what is the best way for that information to be presented? <clears throat> Reading through a PowerPoint, through lecture, Socratic seminar, <clears throat> etc. And again, that all depends on the topic and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if, if you play this out, you know, in the school system, just think in college, if you take psychology, you know, for all of you who learn better by reading that this class is offered at 10 o'clock, for all those who do better by watching someone act out <laughs> psychology and the different things, that class is offered at noon, for, you know, for all those who, you know, I mean, if you think about it, you just go, it's just crazy. The teacher is yeah. no longer teaching. It's it, it also builds this false belief <clears throat> that um, I need to learn it the way that I think best. So, for instance, kids will ask and sometimes in college, I'm going to record the lectures and I'm going to go home and re-listen to them because I'm an auditory learner. Hey, first of all, you just listen to the lecture. If you're an auditory learner, how come you didn't pick it up on the first go-round? Mm -hmm. It's a colossal waste of time and we would be better off teaching kids how to take the notes, how to listen and uh, the intonations of the professor's voice, etc., as to what's important to write down. Mm -hmm. And this works in conjunction with how our brain stores memory into mm -hmm. long term is wasting another two hours in your dorm re-listening. Let's look at number two. Okay, number two. Okay, one last thing I just want to say, and that student might check out while they're assuming they're going to listen to it later. They're really maybe just sort of letting go and they're not even paying attention the first get first time around where they could have asked questions then. You know, if they'd been listening, they might have had a question that came up. And yeah, so it's kind of a, it's almost permission to just sort of postpone the actual attendance, really, <clears throat> getting something. Taking five classes, uh, uh, yeah. and, you know, an hour and a half each, and then if you're doing stop, start with the notes, you're basically, there's 40 hours of listening. I mean, have you done the math on that? Okay, number two. When I read, I often find that I V. Visualize what I am reading in my mind's eye. A. Read out loud or hear the words inside my head. K. Fidget and try to feel the content. Melanie, which which one? <laughs> Scott. Well, I hear my. I mean, I can I can visualize. It. I know Scott's I, I, answer. <laughs> in question. Principle, I, I know. I will say that we all, when we get to a difficult passage, maybe we're losing focus or it's particularly hard read it out loud and that is a good strategy but probably we're not going to read all of it out loud it really slows down your reading time yeah and again it's like what the hell are we talking about fiction a poem um yeah, non-fiction right. when i read i often find that i well what the hell are you reading if you often find and you're reading fiction all the time and you're visualizing well maybe it's because you're reading fiction or if you're reading like biology all the time and you're thinking about the words, maybe it's because you're reading freaking physics, you know, like, yeah, who doesn't like try to visualize stuff when they're reading a work of fiction, you know, hello. 
That's a good point that when someone's reading and depending on how you define visualize, but if you're asking and thinking about how these things applied, that is a good strategy. But telling the kid they're a kinesthetic learner then crosses that off of their list of study tools because, oh, I'm not that kind of learner. Yeah. And so when they're taking notes, there's something called dual coding. So if you're not only writing words, but you're drawing maybe little pictures and so on that help you associate, that forms a deeper long-term memory connections. But again, if someone says, oh, well, I'm not artistic and I, I learn better by listening, then they don't use that well-established method. Mm-hmm. And fidget and try to feel the content. Okay, yeah. So when you're re- when you're reading molecular biology, right? I try to feel the content. <laughs> Look, I'm a carbohydrate. <laughs> Look, I'm a protein. Well, right. and, and certainly they have those science Legos where you can build molecules, and I totally get how that. Uh, yes, it's kinesthetic, but what is it really doing? It's helping kids visualize the abstract concept in their head. Yeah. And that works particularly well, say, for building molecules. And that might work well in elementary school math, where we're doing addition, multiplication, we can do the physical presence of it. And you'll notice that's where a lot of those studies are, is looking at math. You know why? Because you can't do that in high school. <laughs> You're teaching the Inspection Act of 1906 in a kinesthetic fashion. <laughs> yeah. So well, put your own or, you know, you know what happens when people try to teach about slavery in a kinesthetic way, they get busted. They get fired. You don't do that. Or they teach, like, about prejudice or something in a, you know, kinesthetic way. You're gone. It causes that abuse to the kids. Year, what? School, I think it's last year that had the elementary students go to a, it's a model plantation, and they had the kids pick cotton. Hmm. Really? It didn't go over well with some of the parents of the African American students. Hmm. So, question then, a little bit about the kinesthetic stuff. You know, there's this craze now. I've got a couple here, actually. The kids have picked up these spinners, these fidget spinners, and then I've heard of these schools that have literally pedals under the desk that kids sit and pedal while they're doing. Now, is this? I'm just curious if this is some attempt at helping the kids move while they're learning to help them. But, I don't know. But, yeah, it's it? different than kinesthetic learning. You know, that's just, and that, that yeah. that's one thing where people could be confused conceptually. And yeah. so the kids, when they're younger, they need to move. And, oh, that makes them a kinesthetic learner. No, that means they just freaking need to move. They need exercise. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, a lot of it is so they can burn off that nervous, fidgety energy. And this is usually boys um, who often get in trouble for not sitting still, and especially when they're younger. They're just not good at that. So my sister has um, some these. She got them from the Internet, these really thick rubber bands that attach on either side of the, the legs of the front of your desk. And so you can put your, it's kind of like a footrest, but you can sit there and bounce your legs all you want. Uh, it's totally silent. Hmm, cool. So that's a great way to accommodate a kid who struggles to sit still. And if we keep him at his desk instead of having to go walk around, but he can bounce his legs, then yes, cognitive gains might occur. Okay. Not probably because he was physically moving, but because we kept him engaged in the task. Right. Okay. Well, the physical that's- movement matters too. It's important for brain function and because the fact that we're rational animals, we're not brain in a vat. Too much platonic philosophy and metaphysics of man has like corrupted. Yeah, the and culture I, I think and that's a separate issue. Certainly, yeah. movement, letting these kids get up and move around when we can is a good thing. But this idea that if we present it in some physical blocks that they push around the desktop, they're going to get greater gains doesn't seem to be supported other than things uh, like the math that we number three when, <laughs> when asked to give directions IV see the actual places in my mind as I say them or prefer to draw them A have no difficulty in giving them verbally K have to point or move my body as I give them <laughs> okay Scott <laughs> Refuse to answer on principle. Say, what? I'm going to say it's a false question because nobody <laughs> gives directions anymore. 
where you just use Google Maps. <laughs> really? Yeah. Just listen to Siri or whoever you have. I used to pride myself on being able to give really clear directions, and I don't get to exercise that skill. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. not kidding. Well, where I come from, it's, you know, that farmhouse down there? Yeah. Well, don't turn there. <laughs> well, it's interesting. There is some research on males and females uh, and how they used to give directions uh, as far as who used landmarks versus go a quarter mile and, you know, turn at the second light and such. Hmm. Yeah. And when you're driving around, people, you know, you probably notice it too. Like, when I'm going somewhere I'm familiar with, I don't know what the streets are. I don't care. I don't pay attention. I just know where to go. You know, I got the landmarks and I know where to turn and like how far to go. You know, you just, I just feel I've gone so far. Okay, it's time to turn. And then I know from the visual things. So it's like an integration of all kinds of different information. Um, and, you know, a street sign is just a name. Sometimes they change. Like one street out here used to be 149, but... For some reason, they changed it to 249. What the hell? <laughs> Inflation. And then in there's place. one street that is and always will be Jack Rabbit Road to me. But now some people call it, they call it FM 1960. And now they call it like Mary Jane Highway or something. I forget who it's like named after. No, it's Jack Rabbit Road. <laughs> Well, I go on bike rides and, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles out in the country, and they don't always label the streets out there. <laughs> yeah. They'll have the street labeled one direction but not the other or a whole intersection where there's no street signs, and you just kind of learn where to go. You don't learn the street. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where I go when I exercise, there ain't no names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I know – certain trees and bends in the creek and things on the trail and stuff like that, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm not asked to give directions anymore either, but then it, it, I mean, how I gave them would depend, but, um, and then it depends who I'm giving them to. Sometimes I got to like point or move my body, no squat. Like, Hey, someone's new on the trail and I, I, I meet them. I go, okay, you want to go this way? And so, of course, I point. You want to go this way, stay along so you can always see the creek, and then you'll come to the bridge and you'll be okay. You won't get lost. Of course, I'm going to move by body and point. What the hell? But I don't always see it in my mind, and I have no difficulty. So sometimes I have to point, and I also have no difficulty. So... What, I can't choose one, so what the hell do I do? You know? Okay, number four. If I, Listen to this, and this is great. If I am sure how to ride it in order to determine if it looks right, or if I am unsure how to spell it out loud in order to determine if it sounds right, if I am unsure how to ride it in order... Oh, they don't have a colon here. Okay, so the thing is on that one, it wasn't... Now I figured it out. It wasn't... Um, finished because on these others it's got colon and then the choices so they really goofed on this one ha, ha, remember who did this Georgia Department of Education <laughs> they can't even finish a sentence I mean can these people like <laughs> edit their own work can you read it again Michael I, I have not okay, it just says so the prompt is if I am unsure how to and then the first one is V write it out or write it in order to determine if it looks right. A. Spell it out loud in order to determine if it sounds right. K. Write it out to determine if it feels right. And and besides, look, on V it says write it in order to determine if it looks right. And K for kinesthetic, that was visual, and then K for kinesthetic. Remember, these are different, different learners. So V is for visual. Write it out to determine, and K is write it out to determine. <laughs> yes, that's it's, such a good difference. <laughs> now I get it. I think they mix some things up there. If we say, for instance, a kid uh, with a word that they've misspelled, writing it out to feel it, I, I really don't think. First of all, the kid doesn't know how to spell it, so he he's not going to know that it feels wrong. 
Yeah. Certainly, we can store physical memories. For instance, my number pad on my computer, when I punch in, um, you know, number codes that I have to punch in repeatedly, I don't even remember what the numbers are. Yeah. In other words, I, yeah. when that pad has gone out and I have to do it on the horizontal row on my computer, I don't know how I have to think what <laughs> I'm so used to, to the muscle. Memory. Yeah. But I would I would really be skeptical of this idea that a kid has that ingrained in, in the writing. Sure. There is research on spelling and um, being able to recognize the word. Um, I'm a pretty good speller, but on certain words it does help to write it out and see how it looks mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. but yeah um and then sometimes it's good to put it down on paper to see if it looks right sometimes sound it out see if it sounds good that last one presumes that the kid knows the correct way to spell it and he's going to recognize that he spelled it wrong when he rewrites it out of muscle memory. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Stretching. Yeah. Okay, number five. When I write, I V am concerned with how neat and well-spaced my letters and words appear. A often say the letters and words to myself. K, push hard on my part or pencil and can feel the flow of the words. I guess they meant pen. Oh, well, push hard on my... No, yeah, push hard on my part or pencil. Pen, maybe. Push hard on my pen or pencil and can feel the flow of the words. Um, well, of course, we use the keyboard a lot, but... If you're writing with a pencil, there for that one. what? Who cares? My answer is on that one. Who cares? And then how does it really <laughs> you know, differentiate you? Can you write a clear thesis? I'm not concerned with are you experiencing the physical manifestation of the pencil as you write, or are you sounding out the letters? Yeah, it's not essential. Uh, yeah, to some extent, we all experience all of those parts. And, and how in a study would you separate that out and measure? Yeah. Oh, you're sounding out or you're feeling the pen. And then on part, like for choice K, I know that's invalid because for one reason, when I was young, I'd push real hard, but it wasn't because I was a kinesthetic learner. It's because I was freaking autistic or something. And it was like mm-hmm. freaking hard for me, you know? So it was mm-hmm. a, a totally different cause. They're getting it all wrong. Um, Any more questions? <laughs> only ten more. <laughs> no, nine. I think eight. Yeah. Um, weird. And and it's, it makes it sound like that's the only thing you're concerned with. Like when I write, there's a whole hell of a lot going on. It's not only one of those things. Uh, you know, when I write, I okay. If someone says that, when I write, I and if they left a blank. Okay, now it's going to take a whole damn encyclopedia to, like, say what's going on when I write, you know? Why don't we move to what some of the research says about... Because this is fun. I want people to see what's going on. Let me see. I'll read them out real quick. We'll go faster. If I had to remember a list of... Okay, because, you know, this is supposed to, like, characterize people for life. This is your learning style. How do you learn best? For one thing, it's based on the questions. Like, are these valid questions to determine what your so-called learning style is? And what? At what age is this given to people? You know, isn't this stuff given to people when they're, like, elementary school? Like, you expect some, like, elementary school or junior high school or even some, like, high school kids to totally to evaluate all the evidence and totally to introspect and to look at every possibility of writing on their, that they've engaged in and answer these questions validly? Like, what the hell is that? Like six. Well, don't they don't they use these results to sort of institute policy sometimes? Like, okay, I mean, like the college courses that are offered for you know same exact class. Oh, these are for the readers. These are for the auditor or listeners. And you know what I mean? It's just like, honestly, what is the point of all this? It really, I mean, what is the questionnaire? I 
had many psychology teachers that have been asked by their school to make a presentation on learning styles. And as a profession, we kind of agree to refuse to do so unless we get to do a, a debunking one. Uh, I spoke to a college professor last night who, in an interview, was asked, you know, kind of what they do or this and that. And they mentioned that, you know, learning styles weren't supported by the research. Well, the interviewee, even though he had a PhD, was a strong supporter of learning styles. And so that interview went south cool. at that point. So number six, if I had to remember a list of items, I would remember it best if V wrote them down, A said them over and over to myself, K move around and use my fingers to name each item. Well, first of all, the Georgia Department of Education should have an I in there. I would remember it best if I wrote them down. I should be there before the colon. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so besides that. I mean, what about y'all? It's like, wrote, I do some of them both. Like, if I'm going to the store, if it's a long list, how long is the list? What are the items? Am I familiar with it? Sometimes it's long and I got to write it down. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I say like three to five things over and over as I'm going to the store. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't get out of my truck and jump around and touch my fingers because <laughs> I'd probably be arrested. People would think I'm weird. <laughs> What's wrong with that guy? T! Burger. What is? Okay, seven. What? what? No, but let's not. Uh, yeah, let's hear it, Scott. What? Well, you know, I had a psychology teacher friend who taught them some vocab once and made up a silly physical dance, and they learned to associate movement with the thing. And so during the test, they could stand up and do the dance and help the recall. Okay, we can establish that effect. What's the practical value of that? In yeah. what job? Right? In a, and, and there's other better methods than that. Oh, and then one thing that, that reminds me, one thing they leave out is um, using some mnemonics, like coming up with a phrase. Like for the Great Lakes, I came up with a phrase. I can't say it on this because it's like um, the student liked to cuss. And so to <laughs> humor her, I had a sentence with some curse words in it. Um, and she just got a kick out of that. She just laughed for like a minute or two straight, literally. And she still remembers it to this day. And she, she was able to get an A on the test, but, um, what it was like remembering the great lakes. Um, and I came up with, you know, and this is like the clean version, but some monkeys hate eating oranges. And, and this is better than some people's thing because this goes from, west to east some people just have some phrase or like sentence that puts them all over the place but this way you can start on the left and go to the right on a map and it's not there if i had to remember a list of items like the great lakes i'm not going to write them down saying them over over or like jump up and dance i'm going to come up with a freaking acronym i'm like like a mnemonic you know Um, or what if it's a list of items that's like in a cause effect sequence then I'm going to understand the cause effect sequence and so I can do it better like I I was able to help someone who he had like what I forget two degrees like freaking microbiology and genetics or something like that and then I was going over with him how to understand the um like what is it the cell cycle i think and he said in some ways he understood it better than he ever had before so he said courses professors tests books but no one ever explained it to him as i did because you know you got like um what is it dang it like uh anaphase euphase and all this stuff and so it's a list of items but they're in a sequence and if you understand the latin um like roots of the words then it makes more sense and so we were able to do that and do this like look at some etymology look at some related words some things like that and it's like oh now i get it that's why it's called that some things like that it makes sense 
So yeah, it depends yeah. on like what kind of list. Seven, True. I prefer teachers who use a board or overhead projector while they lecture, talk with lots of expression, use hands-on activities. Well, like for what freaking class? So again, it's supposed to be something that determines like what kind of learning style you have. But um, yeah, I prefer a dance teacher who uses a board or overhead projector while they lecture. Not... <laughs> Um, I prefer a dance teacher who talks with lots of expression. Well, maybe. I don't know. It depends on the teacher and how they talk. When trying to concentrate, I have a difficult time when there is a lot of clutter or movement in the room. There is a lot of noise in the room. I have to sit still for any length of time. What about all the above? Any other harsh criticism on that one, Scott or Melanie? <laughs> Well, uh, so we, we've already discussed kids needing to move around and that kind of thing. And then certainly other people can be a distraction. But then part of that, too, is teaching kids how to focus. And, yeah. And can, can you study in a loud cafeteria? Right. Because that's a life skill you're going to you're going to need. Mm -hmm. Nine. When solving a problem, I V. Right. Or draw diagrams to see it. A. Talk myself through it. K. Use my entire body or move objects to help me think. Well, what kind of a problem? <laughs> like, is it a, like, okay, so I have a degree in math, a degree in philosophy, and I'm moving at level two certified fitness, fitness trainer. Um, what kind of problem? You know? I like move objects to help me think. I'm going to rearrange the furniture. <laughs> as I yeah, so, like, it depends on the problem. And talking myself through it, it, this this ignores the possibility of thinking through it. Maybe that's kind of what they mean by talk myself through it, but um, it's different. When given written instructions on how to build something, I, V, read them silently and try to visualize how the parts will fit together. A, read them out loud and talk to myself as I put the part together. Parts, not part. K. Try to put the parts together first and read later. Oh. <laughs> and again, oh. it depends. Like, as we've talked about in writing stuff, a lot of people, like, when they write instructions, it's horrible. You know, instructions for a lot of stuff. So, yeah, no wonder a lot of people don't want to look at written instructions because they're so bad. Mm -hmm. So it's not just based on your style, but it's on the fact that the instructions themselves are bad and you don't want to deal with it. Any good dad knows that you throw out the directions and build it, and then, <laughs> and then you tell your wife you don't know why they included those extra parts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah and that you know ignores the fact that to learn some stuff, yet you, you need to do some stuff on your own all the time. You know. I remember one time think I was reading the instructions, and it started with saying some assembly are required. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, no, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> to keep occupied while waiting, I, V, look around, stare, or read. A, talk or listen to others. K, walk around, manipulate things with my hands, or move, shake my feet as I sit. Well, like, where the hell are you? Like at a bus <laughs> stop at a doctor's yeah. office? Are there people you want to talk to? Is there something to read? Is it loud? How the hell can That's you answer? What? I, what? I, when you said that, I visualized a kid walking around a doctor's office, rearranging magazines and such. <laughs> and it must be a visual learner since I visualized it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or stare. How is that? What does that have to do with learning? Your mouth is open and you're staring. And then... When if you are talking or listening to others, are you not looking around? Okay, a few more. I'll read them off really quickly. If I had to verbally describe something to another person, I would V. Be brief because I do not like to talk at length. A. Go into great detail because I like to talk. K. Gesture and move around while talking. 
Um, except for the fact that some people are shy or autistic. Um, how does it... So, if they're shy... Or if they're autistic or something, it's like, how the hell can this apply? How the hell does this differentiate them out? You don't like to talk at length? Well, why? It doesn't mean it's because of your damn learning style. It could be because of something else. And like, who is it? Like, is it someone your age or a teacher or an adult? If, and, and another problem is if you listen to the tenor of these questions, they're really establishing what makes you comfortable. And... The mm-hmm. presumption is if you're comfortable, you learn better. But you really learn when you're uncomfortable. Whether it's physical growth, mental growth, you have to be stretched, and that's uncomfortable. So let me read this paragraph real quick from that study I cited earlier. Cool. Suppose that we ask children what food they prefer. Some <laughs> children might oh, yeah. prefer <laughs> fruit and milk, but the majority will prefer candy and soft drinks. Would this be a justified reason to give these children the food they prefer? We think not, simply because the preferred food will have a negative effect on their health. And then they go into talking about the meta-analyses of of studies. The more you allow the kid to do the preferred learning style, the worse the outcomes. So it's actually negatively correlated. Yeah, when you method gets slightly worse results and again choosing the correct method for delivering the lesson yeah so when we actually look at cause effect relationships and don't get all airy fairy then it's not good <clears throat> um so that was um georgia department of education and here is one, varklearn.com. How do you spell that just quick? V-A-R-K. Oh. Is, is that a, an acronym or is that? Yeah. Oh, Visual. What is, oh, okay. Auditory. Reading. Sure. Kinesthetic. Vark questionnaire version 8.0.1 or 01. We'll do this quick. We can just, it's like online, if that's okay. And then we'll see what we're supposed to be. So, well, I guess we can't because it's just stupid. First question. I have a problem with my heart. I would prefer that the doctor showed me a diagram of what was wrong, described what was wrong, gave me something to read to explain what was wrong, used a plastic model to show me what was wrong. Mm. How's a diagram and a plastic model different anyway? Oh, but I guess they got to do V A R K this time, so you got three thing, four things instead of three. But a diagram <laughs> versus a plastic model, cool. Um, hmm. So, yeah. And what about the person who doesn't want to hear anything? Or what about the person who wants more information? Um, I prefer a presenter or a teacher who uses diagrams, charts, maps, or graphs. Demonstrations, models, or practical sessions. Handouts, books, or readings. Question and answer, talk, group discussion, or guest speakers. Again, what's the topic? Who's the teacher? You know, like, some I've got students I tutor, and a lot of them have to deal with teachers that don't talk English very well. Mm-hmm. And so, <clears throat> they're going to want, you know, some, like, really good handouts or diagrams or something like that. You know, they need that. They don't, they're not going to benefit from question and answer because they don't understand the teacher very well. It depends what subject. Like, for a lot of stuff in math on the previous question, um, some diagrams would help, but I wouldn't want to see a lot of plastic models. <laughs> I don't understand the fundamental theorem of calculus. Could you please show me a, a plastic model? <laughs> Jeez. When learning from the internet, I like interesting written descriptions, lists and explanations, audio channels where I can listen to podcasts or interviews, videos showing how to do or make things, interesting design and visual features. Well, what about all of them? 
literally I freaking all of them. Like when I cleaned out my dryer over the summer, I needed videos. I got to see what's going on and where the screws are and what to do. Or I li- and I listen to podcasts a lot. I read stuff. You know, like some books, they you have to have a book besides because there's diagrams in it. You need to see how like to do a certain exercise and what's going on. You know, I have finished a competition or test, and I would like some feedback. I would like to have feedback from someone who, somebody who talks it through with me. Using graphs showing what I achieved, using examples from what I have done, using a written description of my results. Okay, yeah, cool. So, you wrote an essay, an essay test. Please make a graph showing what I achieved. That's very helpful. Yeah. I mean, what kind of feedback are you talking about? Just how well you did or, like, how to improve? It's vague. I want to learn how to take better photos. I would ask questions and talk about the camera and its features. Use the written instructions about what to do. Nobody does that. Use examples of good and poor photos showing how to improve them. Use diagrams showing the camera and what each part does. Are you really going to learn it from, like, the camera and what each part does? Unless maybe you're learning how to use focus and zoom or something. So, let's see. When I am learning, I read books, articles, and handouts, see patterns in things, like to talk things through, use examples and applications. So Scott, are those, is that a, um, what would the word be, a quadcotomy? Not a dichotomy or trichotomy, but is, is that a good quadcotomy? Use examples and applications versus read books, articles, and handouts? Well, when you said I see patterns in things, our brain is literally a pattern-seeking organism. It's trying to always make sense out of new information and to integrate it with what we already know. Mm-hmm. All yeah. children do that. Um, and so if we find a kid that is particularly strong, let's say he finds a pattern of uh, meter in the poetry or whatever, then all of a sudden he becomes our you know, special sensor of whatever. And the other kids think, oh, well, I'm not good at that. Well, we're all good at that. Let's exercise that as a skill, just like we're going to exercise these other cognitive skills. And some might do better than others. But I'm, I'm not a fan of teaching kids that you're good at this and, the, and therefore by default you're not good at these other skills. Yeah. Yeah. True. But. Yeah, because it seems like if someone's told you're, I mean, to be assessed and told this is the style of learning you're good at, you just almost, I mean, a kid would just almost shut down on all other other avenues and. And if it's not offered in that learning style, well, then they're just not going to be able to learn, they'll yeah. think. I, I'm assuming. Like yeah, they would... think it's metaphysical. They don't understand yet. Right. Yes, exactly. It's like, uh, and by metaphysical, do, do, people, I mean like it's inherent in their nature. Sure, I don't, right. Like some people, when they say metaphysical, they think, oh, ghosts and stuff. Well, no, metaphysics <laughs> really is about the basic nature of reality or man's ba- human being's basic nature. So if someone thinks it's metaphysical, it doesn't mean they, they're they talking about ghosts and stuff or whatever. Yeah. It just means metaphysical in this sense. I mean, philosophically, the child would think it's fixed in his or her nature to do that. What were you going to say, Scott, about Well, yeah, a couple of things. Um, that's one thing we want to get kids to get rid of is this fixed mindset that I'm either smart or I'm not or that I'm good at math or I'm visual and not the others um carol dweck and other researchers have shown that a growth mindset right, getting kids to, to understand that just like in learning a sport or tying your shoes you're gonna have good days and bad but it's about what kind of growth can you build on and that requires all of these tools so just like a carpenter might 
uh, back in the days of handsaws, be really good at cutting a clean line with a handsaw. Um, that doesn't mean he can't drive the hammer and, and other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, but I can I'll put some of this other stuff up in the show notes. Um, some of these other tests, if folks want to continue to look at them, but more of the same stuff. Like on this one, number 12. I play with coins or keys in my pocket. Hello? 23. And on this one, you're supposed to say um, often, sometimes, seldom. And then you get five points if it's often, three if it's sometimes, one if it's seldom. And then you're supposed to be able to peg yourself as auditory, tactile, or visual. So there's one. Um... I chew gum, smoke, or snack while studying. Well, that must be old because they wouldn't put smoke in nowadays. <laughs> um, Is that for elementary or junior high? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> smoke what? Vape. <laughs> Change it to vape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's about right. 23. I feel very comfortable touching others, hugging, handshaking, etc. Mm. Oh, yeah, like. With who? And like at what age? And are they shy? Mm -hmm. Like, give me a break. But, um, that just shows you the lack of scientific rigor involved in some of this. Like, all these different questions, you know, they're different on the different things. They don't have some standard um, some of the stuff is irrelevant there's all kinds of um, variables that like can throw this off lurking variables, conflating variables and everything as they call them in statistics and then in terms of induction and causality there's all kinds of other causes that could explain it that could really be at play but so, you know, that's, and this is the basis on which people are determined to be a certain quote unquote learning style. How, how scientific is this? You know, if it's really true and you're doing it on this, it's like, just like we talked about, you know, there's so much else going on. This is just meaningless, all these questions. Mm -hmm. We can only hope that we're reaching the tipping point. You know, um, the idea that vaccines cause autism has been researched so thoroughly that they just won't research it anymore. Um, um, parapsychology. But I think there could uh, be the possibility on that because they need to include some epigenetics. Not that it's, you know, I don't think you can necessarily say, I don't think vaccines 100% cause autism, but because humans are so complex, I can see that in some cases it could be the straw that broke the camel's back, all this epigenetic stuff going on. But anyway, go ahead. Um, with parapsychology, that's been researched for 40 years. Duke University finally shut down their center studying that. They hmm. couldn't get any statistically significant results. And that's what we're seeing with learning styles is that it did start back as early as the late 50s. Um, really gained steam and then became the big thing in the 90s. And I think it's just riding the wave. And that the research has been done the past 20, 30 years has just really done damage to the idea. But it's got itself into schools. Teachers like it because they feel like they're helping kids and they're individuating instruction. Um, kids like it because they think they found an easy way to learn stuff. And to not and, have to learn certain things. <laughs> Yeah, but and I can't do math. History. It's not my learning style. <laughs> but yeah, so we'll have to dig into some more of that um, in a future episode. Um, <clears throat> now that we've gone over the basic tool that's used, you know, this informed by theory, um, and it's supposed to categorize people into a certain learning style. Um, but it's just meaningless. But then there's yeah a lot more to discuss about this whole topic about learning styles 
we'll have to get into in the future. Um, philosophy, the history of it, um, why it's wrong, things like that. Um, cool. Any last words, guys? Use all the styles. <laughs> yeah, please. Absolutely. Cool. Just like horoscopes. Read them all and pick the one you like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So, um, hope you enjoyed that, folks. Um, hope that helped get this idea, because, like, isn't there some information in there, Scott, in the thing you read um, about the percent that believe this? I think, what, don't still, like, 50 or 90 percent of like students and educators and people in the u.s still believe in learning styles uh, i'd say half to three quarters for sure yeah um, it's and it's just like um like i brought up in a previous episode i think some people were studying chimpanzees one female chimpanzee started putting some straw in her ear and then all these other chimpanzees started doing it that's what learning styles is it's nothing but a piece of straw in people's ears it's just a fad they're following that is meaningless. You know? It's just social behavior. We need to not do that because when we're not in touch with reality, it's not merely like, okay, it's destructive of what we're trying to do in education, what our students and children think of themselves, and it's destructive of making the best of ourselves and our children. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not... It's a disservice to us all. So this idea needs to be eliminated from society. We have other things we need to be thinking about. It's not an irrelevant thing. But um, I'll post some links to some other of these like tests and people can look at them and think about them themselves as we did. You know, and I think that's that's a value. One value of the test is if people apply logic and critical thinking to the questions, as we did, then they're going to get more out of them than <laughs> this like straw in the ear of like I'm a visual learner or whatever. But cool. So hope you enjoyed that, folks. We got to go. Please tell people about the podcast and donate to the podcast so we can get more rational ideas out there and make education better. All right. It's great. Valuable. Peace out, Boy Scout. Peace out, Girl Scout. Peace out, all their kind of scouts. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.